Hello, and welcome to a new segment of Let's Get It Straight. Our discussion today is going to focus on a new topic hitting everywhere across the country. We're going to talk about N95 respirators versus surgical masks for protection for EMS personnel. And that begins with understanding the difference between evidence-based practice and the KISS principle. So we'll begin with defining evidence-based practice. Evidence-based practice is the blending of clinical expertise, patient values, and the best research evidence into the decision-making process for patient care. Clinical expertise refers to the clinician's accumulated experience, education, and clinical skills. Let's compare that to what we're hearing more about in decision-making, the KISS principle. The K stands for keep, I for it, S for simple, and there's a second S for stupid. So what about respirators versus surgical masks? And that's what we're going to go into discussing right now. The CDC and the World Health Organization defines airborne transmissible diseases as tuberculosis, measles, and chickenpox. An important point to remember, hospital guidelines are different than EMS guidelines. And it seems that many decision makers across the country are simply focusing on hospital guidelines from the CDC and not EMS guidelines. We see some clarification in the CDC TB guidelines. There are specific pages that address EMS. Also, we get clarification on transport of patients with TB, chickenpox, measles, and COVID-19 in all the documents from the CDC and the World Health Organization. It states, place a surgical mask on the patient for transport. I just want to add that that's also in the hospital guidelines, that if in hospital they're going to transport a patient elsewhere in the hospital or to another facility, they are to put a surgical mask on the patient and they, the care providers, do not need an N95 or to also wear a mask. So let's go then to transmission-based precautions. For airborne precautions, it states, patients known or suspected to be infected by the airborne route, such as TB, measles, and chickenpox, quote, healthcare personnel transporting patients who are on airborne precautions do not need to wear a mask or a respirator during transport if the patient is wearing a mask or if they have skin lesions like with chickenpox that those are covered. If the patient cannot tolerate a mask or a non-rebreather, then the care provider would wear a surgical mask. So what do hospital guidelines say about a patient on airborne precautions? Read carefully. Ensure appropriate patient placement 
in an airborne infection isolation room, an AIIR, constructed according to the guideline for isolation precautions published by the CDC. This is not your world. Hospital guidelines are different than those for EMS. The CDC has a statement on respirators specific to COVID-19. For fire EMS use, it states, they are only needed if performing aerosol generating procedures. One of those listed is open suctioning. EMS personnel do not do open suctioning. You maintain a closed filtered system. In the hospital setting, those systems are broken open for instilling medications for taking samples. Again, that is not your world. EMS does not perform open suctioning. So respirator use for COVID-19 would focus on if you are going to be doing CPR, intubation, or administering medication through a nebulizer. The World Health Organization also has a statement on the use of respirators for COVID-19, specific once again for fire EMS, focusing on aerosol generating procedures as the only time one might need to wear an N95. Again, open suctioning is not performed by fire EMS personnel. So what is left would be CPR or intubation. The CDC updated COVID-19 guidelines for EMS on September 23rd of 2022. Not much change, just a little bit more uh, concise statements. Number one, close the door or window between the compartments before loading the patient. When transporting, vehicle ventilation in both compartments, the HVAC system, should be on the non-recirculating mode. This is to maximize air exchanges that reduce potentially infectious particles containing in the vehicle. If the vehicle has a rear exhaust fan, it's used to draw air again away from the cab toward the patient care area and out the back of the vehicle. With regard to aerosol generating procedures, we should consult medical control before initiating them. And bag valve masks and other ventilatory equipment should have a HEPA filtration to filter the expired air. NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, also published a statement specific to EMS with regard to engineering controls for COVID-19, that it would include the use of HVAC systems in a vehicle, as we just discussed. A recent NIOSH study showed that particle clearance could be improved by the use of the rear vent fan and that it should be positioned on the high setting in conjunction with the provision of outside air through the vehicle's main HVAC systems. Another EMS difference for COVID-19, for example, that precautions depended on the community infection rate. In the hospital setting, the care, everything was same, same, but not for EMS. That was in the first EMS guidelines that were 
put out in July of 2021. They gave different categories, and depending on what category, the rate of infection fell for your geographic service area, it told you what PPE was needed for your practice setting. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this segment, this is a current issue all across the country because we're seeing different things being published with regard to EMS. For example, the EMS playbook states, PPE for airborne diseases includes N95 respirators for purposes of consistency and simplicity. The use of respirators for all infectious agents known to be transmitted by infectious aerosols is recommended for consistency and simplicity. Hmm. It's important to note that there are no recommendations for N95 respirator use for air, all airborne and droplet diseases from the CDC or World Health for EMS that we focus on source control, sustaining secretions at the source. The source is the patient and we contain their secretions with the use of a mask. Another document that has been put out for EMS is the Infectious Disease Playbook. It lists airborne diseases as measles, monkeypox, TB, and chickenpox, and states a disposable NIOSH-approved fit-tested respirator would be used, again, for consistency and simplicity. Interesting wording. Does that sound scientific? The New Hampshire Bureau of EMS had also put out a statement addressing airborne precautions, and this is their rationale. It states, at this time, there is no way for EMS providers to accurately determine the nature of a patient's respiratory illness in the field. Hmm. It goes on to say an N95 is an effective or better than a surgical mask at protecting a healthcare provider from airborne pathogens. And adhering to keep it simple is a good idea. So that is K-I-S, correct? Keep it simple. It's important to note that the New Hampshire Bureau of EMS says KISS is keep it simple. As I said, that only addresses one S. The second S stands for stupid. It states an N95 is as effective as or better than a surgical mask. Again, hmm. So the CDC put out a statement specific to EMS with regard to tuberculosis. This is what I've referred to in other segments of Let's Keep It Simple in doing a little bit of homework. What is generally stated, verifying what are in these documents that are currently being put out. The CDC guidelines for preventing transmission of TB in healthcare settings 
was published in December of 2005 and has a section specifically dealing with EMS starting on page 25. On page 26 under EMS, it states, persons with suspected or confirmed TB who are transported in an ambulance should wear a surgical mask or procedure mask if possible. And drivers, healthcare workers, and other staff who are transporting the patient might consider wearing an N95. But the final statement, there is no requirement for EMS personnel to wear an N95 respirator while transporting a TB patient. If we are getting into full usage of respirators, we must comply with OSHA's respiratory standard 1910.134, which requires a medical evaluation be conducted because not everyone can wear an N95. And that fit testing is required and it must be done at least annually. We have many, many studies, numerous studies, on the effectiveness of surgical masks versus N95s. There have been, as I said, many uh, studies. I have at least copies of 11 of them. Remember, one study does not yield scientific validity. You need at least three studies conducted the same way that yield the same result to have scientific validity. So, there are many studies if you search the literature and they all seem to state the same thing. There is no increased protection from these diseases using an N95 over a surgical mask. So let's review an example of one of the published articles comparing N95s and surgical masks. The article is entitled, What Mask Should I Wear to Protect Against Transmissible Acute Respiratory Infections? On the first page, it states clearly, clinical trials have not shown any direct advantage to using an N95 respirator compared with a surgical mask for many acute respiratory infections. Later on in the article, N95s have been found to be better than surgical masks in laboratory studies, but this has not been translated into a clinical advantage. And clinical trials conclude that evidence remains insufficient to determine whether N95 respirators are superior to surgical masks in protecting healthcare personnel from acquiring acute respiratory infections in the clinical setting. So this is just one example. So it is safe to say that there's no published scientific data stating respirators are required for airborne diseases for EMS personnel. So we want to make decisions based on good scientific information. There are also cost considerations. Medical masks cost about 21 cents each and N95 about $1.95 each. But there are other things in place that protect us beyond a mask. So what is in place? 
Number one, OSHA and the Centers for Disease Control require that there be education and training on disease signs and symptoms. All of them that are airborne are included. So you are to be receiving education and training that would help you based on the patient's presenting symptoms to ascertain if it may be an airborne transmissible disease. Also required is education and training on transmission-based procedures. How does the patient present? Do you think it's airborne? Then we would know what precautions we should take. The Ryan White Law states that your department is to have a designated officer and that if all else fails, post-exposure medical follow-up program must be in place to ensure that any exposed employee is followed up for an exposure. And that there is to be a focus on offering preventative vaccines. Currently, EMS training programs across the country are now requiring that all these vaccines be received before entering the training program. This significantly lowers the possibility for the provider to acquire chickenpox, measles, COVID-19, or pertussis, whooping cough. We eliminate the risk by vaccination. And then, as we have discussed earlier, we have our vehicle protections. You have your rear exhaust fan, that your HVAC system would go on the non-recirculating cycle for heat or air conditioning. You have short transport times for the most part. You don't have prolonged contact with the patients as is seen in a medical facility. And we focus on source control, containing secretions at the source, the patient. We also need to remember that OSHA and the CDC always address the hierarchy of controls, hierarchy of safety or risk management. Number one, can we physically remove the hazard? Well, in the provision of healthcare, that really may not be possible. We go then to engineering controls. You know, for bloodborne pathogens, our engineering controls was needle safe devices. And what happened to contaminated needle strick injuries? They dropped dramatically. For airborne droplet diseases, once again, you have your rear exhaust fan, you have your HVAC system set on the non-recirculating cycle. That lowers risk significantly. Next in place, administrative controls. Making sure that you have education and training as required by OSHA as they enforce the CDC guidelines. Number two, that you have a good exposure control plan in your department that addresses uh, personal protective equipment. Last on the list, as you see, under least effective is personal protective equipment. Many people believe that PPE is their sole protection. But I hope this diagram clears that up a little bit. It is a protection, but it's not your sole protection. 
So let's use a quote from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle from his book, Hounds of the Baskervilles. He stated, that which is clearly known hath less terror than that which is but hinted and guessed. Education and training is an important key part of healthcare. The more we understand and know about the diseases and how we can protect ourselves, the more comfortable we can be at performing our job tasks. So in basic infection control, our keep it simple and not stupid because we have our education and training is to be evidence-based. Two guidelines, very basic, very simple. Patient presents with fever and a rash, put a mask on the patient. If the patient presents with fever and a cough, put a mask on the patient. That alone will significantly reduce exposures to airborne, or we can add droplet transmitted diseases. So we've talked about evidence-based as opposed to the KISS principle, which seems to be what is widely published right now in the EMS community. This boils down to making clear what is a medical need versus what might be an administrative decision. A department has a choice. Do they want to go across the board, live in N95 respirators or not? What does the science tell us? respirators or surgical masks, a choice, not an established medical need or requirement. I think that's key to helping us understand what we need to do in caring for our patients. So that brings us to the end of this segment of Let's Get It Straight. And I hope this information has been helpful. Remember, it doesn't take long to do a little homework and check things out. And always remember that hospital guidelines are not the same as what EMS needs to do in the field. If I can be of any further assistance, please give me a call or send an email. I thank you again for your time and attention, and I hope we'll get together again soon.